Good morning. I'm very pleased to be here, quite honored to have been invited to this workshop. How ordinary are ordinary perpetrators? The idea of uh, ordinary people committing extraordinary evil in extraordinary situations is very pervasive in history and the social sciences. And I must have collected at least 40, maybe by now 50 titles with these words, even how good people commit atrocities. Uh, and it very strongly accentuates, stresses the importance of what we call socialization, the social formation of opinions and attitudes and loyalties and the internalization of social norms and ideas and the immediate situation in which uh, people are feel a strong urge to conform, to obey to the situation. It is, in fact, by now a consensus in the social sciences, which is quite rare because we tend to argue about almost everything. Uh, footnote. I think that when we talk about mass violence and extreme uh, atrocities, we're basically talking about evil, the subject that had been mentioned by Svirtus, letter only. Evil is a religious concept. And most people who work on this issue are thoroughly secular. But almost all of them have had grandparents or parents who were brought up in a religion. And somehow, in the entire thinking about these ordinary people, a very Christian idea sleeps under the surface. And it is, we are all ordinary people. Our spirit, uh, our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. This is the Catholic version. Or we are prone to all evil and incapable of any good. This is the Calvinist's version. And then, do not lead us into temptation, which is the bad situation in which these weak persons come, because then we will commit terrible sins. Why do I mention that? Because we are, in fact, talking about evil. And it is, we have been talking about evil for two or 3,000 years by now. And so it is only obvious that there should be latent religious elements which have every right to be there, but they should be recognized. Also, there is a strange tenacity in people to cling to this idea of ordinary people as perpetrators, uh, especially those who are very impressed by the work of Hannah Arendt. And I could never figure out why people would cling to this idea so strongly but maybe it is because there are religions. So we have to face the problem that we're in the company of great intellectuals in the past 3,000 years who have also thought about all this and who somehow have been submerged in the discussion. Now, this idea that the situation may transform ordinary people into extraordinary evildoers uh, has a long history, as I mentioned, and I think it is mostly correct. And it also is more correct than most of us tend to think when we think about ourselves. We'd never do such a thing, and our friends would never do such a thing. So this the situation is view is, is to be taken very, very seriously. And the most important evidence for it has been supplied by Christopher Browning, who had this group of extreme uh, mass killers who were more or less randomly selected from a population. He called his book Ordinary Man. He shouldn't have done that. He should have called it Ordinary Germans because these people who were randomly selected from a population were selected from a population which had lived through uh, it was a generation which had left through, lived through the First World War, through the complete hyperinflation, the, the chaotic Weimar Republic, the Great uh, Depression, 
and then the ascent of Hitler, and by 1941, eight years of the most total, the most incisive, the most perverse and rousing propaganda maybe any population has ever been subject to, and there was no escape from it. So these people were ordinary Germans, but by that time, Germans were a rather special population. Still, from that rather special population, uh, the huge majority was willing, they wouldn't have called it willing, to follow orders. They did what they were told, and as Browning says, they did so uh, more or less willingly. Some were eager killers, some tried to stay, stay out of it as much as they could, and the majority were rather indifferent followers of the, the schedule. And the atrocities are completely mind-boggling, and they went on not for hours or days or weeks, but months, as uh, Richard Fried has already reminded you. So this is very important evidence, because here we have people who were randomly selected, uh, who could at a certain moment opt out, but were subject to immense group pressures. And one of the interesting arguments was it was disloyal to have your comrades do the dirty but necessary work for the future of our beloved Germany. Uh, you uh, deserted them in their moment of their hardest trials and their greatest effort for the great Nazi effort against uh, uh, the threat of all mankind, the Jews. Uh, I'm choosing the words which must have impressed them at the time quite a bit. But most cases are different. And one of the major uh, differentiations which should mean is precisely the degree of compulsion or voluntariness in the recruitment of the perpetrators. When there is strong pressure or even compulsion, as in the case of Battalion 101, personal differences count for much less than, for example, if we have a, what Horowitz called a uh, ethnic riot, uh, people tend to self-select. There's something going on on the main square, it's very exciting, and people go there and some people don't go. By the way, we don't see the people who don't go. 90% of the people don't. Uh, so when you see a pogrom, that's what you see. You don't see the non-participants. There is self-selection. And there, of course, individual characteristics count for much more. Now, I think it's very important that we should define what we're talking about. Not always. You shouldn't always be so precise. I'm talking about uh, mass annihilation. And that means, on a grand scale, the more the masser, uh, asymmetric violence. That is, armed and organized men mostly, usually young men, healthy men, physically healthy, against unarmed and unorganized human beings of all kinds and sorts. And usually when we look at these large kills, asymmetric killings, at some point, at least in the past two centuries, one sees the state as the actual organizer or at least as the condonor or instigator. Uh, but the state is always present. What we also see is that it happens either just before or in the shadow of or just after war, rebellion, civil war. There's already a lot of disintegration and violence going on. And then, one, I'm mostly talking about perpetrators who are in direct contact with their victims, who see them, let's say, eye to eye. That excludes bombings. By the way, bombings are very interesting 
because we tend to have a blind spot for them, aerial bombings. Why? Because we were so successful as Western nations, and it has brought us so much advantage to this very day. So we t tend to have a blind spot for the moral implications of aerial bombing. Famines I exclude, although they're very, very important and interesting, and maybe one of the greatest source of atrocity killings. And I mainly talk about, first of all, uh, conqueror's frenzy. The moment that an invading army is victorious, it confronts its helpless opponents, it confronts a helpless civilian population, and they go into a frenzy. That's a very, uh, uh, it happens all the time, and I think that the, the episode behind the Eastern Front may in part be explained as an army having gone berserk in the moment of temporary victory. Another form is what you call re, um, a regime of terror. That's typically the Soviet Union, uh, Maoist China, uh, the, 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 the Nazi regime, uh, in, especially in the interior or where it had a stable occupation. Another form is um, the triumph of the losers. This happens all the time, and Fried mentioned it. Uh, Germany, basically after February 1943, knew that it was losing, that it was facing imminent defeat by a foreign invader. And yet, as we mentioned, it would sacrifice military opportunities in order to keep, go, continue exterminating its great historical enemy. It would lose the war, but it would change history forever by wiping off the face of the earth the Tutsis or the Jews and mankind's fate would be changed once and for all, even if we lose this war. And then there are mega pogroms, which at the first sight seem to be disconnected ethnic riots, but they are coordinated by a major historical event, such as the onslaught of the, the, the Soviet troops and the collapse of the German armies in Middle Europe, in Central Europe, or more or less two or three years later, and very similar, the withdrawal of the British occupying colonial army in India, the succession of Pakistan, and a, 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 the, the, a, an enormous number of communal riots in which either Hindus killed Muslims or Muslims killed Hindus because Hindus had been doing it somewhere else. Uh, in, so these are rather different situations in which, for example, the element of self-selection and therefore the element of possible individual differential uh, predispositions plays a smaller or a larger role. Now, as we're talking about interdisciplinarity, my approach is one in which I combine let's say, macro-sociological elements, such as long-term developments of state formation and uh, national ideologies. That's one level, macro-sociological, with the meso-sociological level of a movement, a party, a leader that conquers the state apparatus and controls the regime and then begins to take all sorts of institutional measures of exclusion. And then the, the, the micro-sociological level of direct interaction, either in normal everyday situations in which you try to avoid the target groups, people, you don't want to be associated with them, and social embarrassment and shame and distancing play a role, but also, for example, the micro-sociological interaction of the actual killing fields, uh, the, the uh, killing compartments. And finally, what I'd like to call the psychosociological level of in 
personal effect and perception uh, where people personally experience strong feelings towards the, the target population. And the, 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 the unifying idea in this, this account is the concept of compartmentalization, which plays a role in Fried's work too, uh, which is the increasing separation, division, between what I call the regime's people, the major if you want to call them the majority, and on the other hand, the target people. A process of ex extreme identif identification with one's own people and extreme disidentification with the target people, with the others. Now, identification and disidentification are two sides of the same coin, but here we are talking about extreme uh, identification and disidentification. I'll leave most of this. I wrote a book about it. Here it is, so I don't, I'm not under the pressure to explain everything. If you want to uh, know more about it, just get the, the book, which has been translated in French with a very economic title, Diviser pour tuer. And that is more or less the core of what. I have to say, uh, what I want to go into a little bit more are the uh, whether we can speak and to what degree of a individual or a personal predisposition to become a perpetrator. This is strongly opposed by most people who work in the field and also by people who make a spontaneous uh, judgment, outsiders who have thought about it, and people feel that somehow it is unfair to, to, to uh, single out certain people as predisposed to become perpetrators. Because after all, if you and I were in the same situation, we might have done the same thing. This is the sentence that occurs either in the preface or in the uh, last pages of many, many books on the subject. And somehow to believe this is a mark of moral, how should I say, universalism. We all are potential sinners deep inside. I don't argue with this. This may, may well be true. But I do think that we should look at perpetrators as maybe to some degree, in some respects, statistically somewhat different from people who were not perpetrators. It would be gradual, it would be a probability distribution, and it would be about certain respects. Well, first of all, and this recurs in, in almost every observation, uh, there is a sense of conformism among these killers because they are part of a very large group, an army, a police, a special battalions who have been recruited by a dominant current in society. These are conformists. Whereas those people, for example, who volunteered to join ISIS in Syria, march to a different drama. And there is a sense of rebellion, even if they are recruited in the mosque, and of defiance. But the, the, the members of Police Battalion 101 were conforming to what was then the mainstream in society. From a historical, sociological point of view, this is very important. Second, we find many, many observations that there is an authoritarian strain, whatever that may mean, in the perpetrators. Uh, and one might find a what I call ideological saturation. These are people who are, have become strong adherents, believers in all sorts of ideals that go with the... the, the genocidal regime. So these are general observations. But then we must 
owe up to the fact that really we hardly know anything about perpetrators. Because first of all, it is totally impossible to observe them during their work, because either that's the last thing you ever will observe, or you are yourself deeply implicated as their commander or their comrade. So we don't, all the normal methods of social science don't apply. Secondly, no perpetrators or very, very few mass killers are ever brought uh, before uh, their judges. Mass murder is the safest job on the planet. And only in those cases where the regime is completely defeated will a small minority, the unlucky ones, I'm being cynical, the unlucky ones be arrested, brought before uh, to court, tried and convicted and punished. In the, one of the most persecutory regimes, post-Nazi Germany, I think a few thousands on a few hundred hundred thousands of perpetrators. In Rwanda, yes, very, very, 300,000 were jailed. But there was almost, uh, there was very little actual serious attempt at trying them. So almost all we know about perpetrators comes from judicial documents. And in judicial documents, from Eichmann on, they all do the same. Your Honor, I didn't hate our opponent, I had no strong feelings. I did not prove, uh, experience any kind of pleasure or elation. It was just a job. How did I get into it? Well, I just happened to have a friend who said, are you looking for a job? Yeah, well, I know a job for you as a guard. What kind of guard? Well, something in Poland, the Sobibor, we've never been there. So I go to, so your, your honor, you understand. Huh? So, the, the, the very central uh, idea of agency is very much diminished because we read judicial documents. Huh? And ideological saturation is played down because they stand before their judges. They're, then, when the, by the time we get to talk to them as investigators, as social scientists or historians, they're usually in jail. They are, it's a post-genocidal phase, and these conformist people who put so much effort for the love of their country in saving their countrymen now have to see that the country has turned against them and that they're accused of all sorts of things which they, while they, all they did was try and rid their, their own nation from these hostile elements. What injustice, quotation marks, by the way, uh, but still. So when we meet them, either before their judges or convicted, or when they have to hide their past, and we know very little of them. I think it was Baron and, 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 and Charney who, in the 80s, sent 900 German pastoral workers and psychotherapists to let to ask, had they ever treated a former perpetrator, or did they even know about such a case, and they came up with only one case on a, of a perpetrator on his dying bed who had consulted a pastoral walker. This is one of the great conundrums. Why do we not see any sign of psychological conflict in post-genocidal perpetrators? Whereas veterans and victims uh, decades later, still suffer from the consequences. There's one simple answer. The perpetrators were not afraid. They didn't have to fear much, except maybe the wrath of uh, post-war uh, enemies. Whereas the victims and veterans, especially of guerrilla-type wars, live in constant vital f anxiety, which is highly traumatizing. Except, again, there is a little doubt here, too. Where in the, the, uh, the, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Committee, and now in the Colombian uh, Integración y Demobilización uh, program, 
the perpetrators indeed owe up to strong feelings of remorse and contrition and uh, horrible dreams. They cry, they weep. They are sentient, feeling human beings. So maybe when a social space is created where that liberates an emotional space where people can live with certain emotions without immediately being uh, punished or locked up or completely rejected, this emotion, they may have these experiences. Uh, but again, there's, we know very little about this. Now, do we have presumptions? Uh, yes. In the accounts of perpetrators, their memoirs or interviews with them, or even their, uh, their statements if before their judges, it is striking that indeed they do seem to have a moral conscience. Uh, and that pertains to their commanders. They obey and they are faithful. Uh, they're especially loyal to their comrades. Meine Ehre heißt Treue. My honor is loyalty, said uh, it's the SS, uh, uh, what the SS wore on their, their belt clips. But they're serious. They were serious about that. They also tend to be, in the post-genocidal phase, good husbands and family fathers and colleagues. But then, when we look at it, this is a moral conscience for a very restricted circle. And everybody who is outside that circle may drop dead, and they're always willing to help a little. Uh, this is exactly the uh, gist of Himmler's famous Poznan speech in which he explains uh, that there is only loyalty to one's immediate environment and the, the ideological transfiguration of it, the Volk. The Volk is a very, uh, very uh, immediate projection of these intimate circles. The second thing is, and the theme crops up again, they have a remarkably low sense of agency, but most of what we know is in front of the judges, where it's very important to escape responsibility. And thirdly, probably most importantly, and also with a very close connection to uh, a neuropsychological res research, they have a very low sense of empathy. And uh, sympathy and compassion and pity seem to be almost completely lacking. Uh, I have a, a, a rather, uh, how should I say, shocking quotation. One of the 101 uh, murders testifies, oh, it was awful, it was horrible. I, got this, I couldn't stand the screaming of the victims, and I got blood and brains all over my uniform. But what he was saying is it was terrible for him. He didn't say it was all that terrible. It was not about the victim. So it seems like there is a hole where normally the... And, and here is obviously there is a, a common uh, understanding with Reese people who did work like, like uh, I think it's Baron Cohen and Tomasello who work on uh, the, the neuropsychology of empathy. And as this is a workshop where we try to, 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 to bring together interdisciplinary knowledge, so far I think I can work at the macro, meso sociological level, the micro sociological level, and the psycho sociological level, because I think by now social scientists have succeeded in develop, developing a vocabulary that allows them to switch to all these different levels. But it remains extremely problematic to work with uh, biologists, medical people, neuropsychologists, uh, and even evolutionary psychologists. It seems that there is now a chasm in our culture 
and that there seem to be two vocabularies, and we do not quite know how to translate them one uh, on one. Uh, so that is one of the things we probably ought to, to try and do. I have, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>